You ready for Christmas? Who got their shopping done? Who goes Christmas Eve? I'll see you there. We'll hang out. We'll fight over something. Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. You know, I'm partial to Thanksgiving just because of the meal and the fact that there's no stress because you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to, you know, fake like, ooh, thank you. This is just what I wanted. You never have enough toe socks. Wear those sandals to show them off. Christmas is wonderful. It's, it's joyous. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, you get, you get the lights going, and you get the smell of the tree. Everybody got your trees? Your pine tree? Did everyone go on a day that they were frozen solid? Who went? And you cut the straps, expecting the tree to go, wah, and it didn't. And it stayed straight up. And as you tried to pull the branches apart, I went with a buddy of mine. And as soon as we got it lashed up onto, the, onto his Subaru, we realized that it had frozen so much that when they put it through the little binder, they snapped all the branches. Yeah, I know it's sad. Because mostly because it was freezing and we had to stay out there for another 20 minutes while he found the perfect tree. So anyway, it's just a wonderful time. There's just great stories and hanging out with family and hanging out with friends and, and, and drinking eggnog. and It's amazing. And so what would be just perfect right now to talk about? The apocalypse. We're going to talk about the end times today. Baby Jesus in the end of the world. <laughs> Joy to the world, it soon will end. This is going to be great. I'm not an end times guy. I never have been. You know, I, when I was a kid, I went to a couple seminars. Don't ask me why my parents hated me this much, but they took me to seminars on the end times. And the best thing about the end time seminars was there was always free juice and free cookies just to make you feel better about your life after leaving each session, you know, to kind of like placate you and give you a little bit of comfort after talking about the apocalypse and, you know, crazy multiple headed scary things with tons of eyes and wings and, you know, just Jim Henson's worst nightmare or something. But Christmas actually is a great time to talk about the end times. Christmas is one of the perfect times to talk about the end times because end times basically start in, in, in some ways and you know we're going to talk about a couple different views of the end times and there are a lot of different views, okay? So if you're in a different camp, cool. And I'm not going to say that you're wrong. Please don't say that everyone else is wrong. There, there are four main views that we're going to kind of look at. We're going to touch on them briefly just as a springboard to really see what, what's the heart of what we're supposed to look at. But the end times, kind of really the, the thing that really just changes human history and gets everyone looking forward and, and, and you know, waiting for the end of the world is the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ is the game changer. It's God entering human history and changing things once and for all. It's amazing. It's a joyous thing because it gives us hope. It gives us peace. It gives us, it gives us a, a thing to look forward to, to get us through the, the hard days and the hard nights of following the Lord and, and waiting. So before I get into all that, we're going to read some Bible. And if you are just like hurting and it's hard for you to stand right now, you may want to stay seated. Uh, we're going to read a lot of Scripture. So, you know, if, if you need to stay seated, please do. But for the rest of us, everybody just stand and we're going to read the Word. Matthew 24. Verse 1. And we're not going to read everything here. We're going to, we're going to skip around a little bit. Jesus left the temple and was walking away. When his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings, do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming 
and of the end of the age. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will... Vengeance. All right, let's keep going. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive you. You will hear of wars and rumor of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Skipping down. Go ahead. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the, son of the, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Skipping to 36. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming. He would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at the hour when you do not expect him. I was going to keep reading. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. where There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you that you give us hope for eternity. But Lord, we eagerly wait for you to return. Lord, may we be ready. In your name. Amen. Please be seated. So that's a lot of scripture to chew on. And one of the things we're going to do is, you know, when you talk about the end times, there's a lot of terms that come up, and, and they're kind of crazy terms, and so we're going to briefly touch on them. And if you really want to dig into what all the, the end times are about, and the tribulation, the millennium, and, and, you know, the last things, eschatology, if you want to dig into that, we'll save that for a day we're talking about Revelation 20, because that's where it really, you know, gets kind of serious about that. This, we're going to look at something a little bit different. But just to give you kind of some, some a basis of where we're at and why we're talking about this, there's a couple terms. Millennium. Now, we understand that to be a thousand years, but in the terms of eschatology, there's a lot of disagreement about what that actually means. It could mean literal a thousand years. It could mean a, a long period of time. Some 
are not even sure if it's really a specific set of time or if it's just continual and it's been going. But it basically comes down to the, the length or, or the, the time when, when Christ will reign. When Christ will reign, either on earth physically or spiritually. And again, that's a, a, a sticking point for different views of the end times. Other things we're going to talk about is tribulation. And an easy way to explain tribulation, I mean, if you've seen Left Behind, have you seen Left Behind? Anybody see that or read that? Remember those? Kid from Growing Pains? Getting a lot more serious. You know, he, he, Tim LaHaye and, and Left Behind, they're definitely of a, a certain style that I'm not going to mention, but you might be able to figure it out when we talk about it. Um, you know, they're, they're sure that the tribulation is a specific point in history. Others are, are, are saying, wait, is it, is it specific or is it, is it literal or is it sporadic? Does it happen here and does it happen there? Or is it continual? Is it just the, the, the general tribulation that we all go through as Christians, that we're all persecuted for our faith, we all struggle, we all struggle against our flesh? What does that relate to? Rapture. Rapture's a crazy one. Rapture's the one that scares us, like the pilot's going to get raptured when we're in a plane. Right? Rapture, you know, my, this is my terminology, and so the best way I can think to describe the, the rapture is like God snagging you home. Okay? God snagging you to meet with him. That's, that's kind of my thing with, when it comes to the rapture. Second coming, we're going to talk about that. Second coming is the coming after the first coming. The first coming is Christmas. Second coming is when he comes again eventually to receive his kingdom and to bring us in, however that looks, to usher us into a, a time of eternity and living in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, it's weird. It's hard to talk about when there's so many different views, I mean, they all describe the terms differently. So let's look at a couple of them. And we're going to pull up a, a slide that's going to tell you a couple things. And we're going to go through it really quick. This is, uh, this is from not mine. I didn't take this. I forget the guy's name. So if you're out there and you ever watch this video, I'm sorry that I didn't give you copyright information. Please sue me, not Cornerstone. Amillennialism. The tribulation and the millennium are right now. That We're living in it right now. Okay? So there will be no physical millennium. There will be no specific set of time. The millennium is the present, the spiritual reign of Jesus with his people. Jesus may return to earth at any time. The tribulation occurs whenever Christians are persecuted or wars and disasters happen. Okay? So that's one of them. Next one. Post-millennialism. Jesus will return to the earth after post a millennium when the overwhelming majority of people throughout the world embrace the gospel. So the millennium is going to be an amazing time of where the gospel is just preached with such fervor that, that people are just continuing to accept him and life is getting better and better and better. The great tribulation occurred either in the first century A.D. and they kind of, it's, it's interesting, they, there's differing degrees, you know, did it, did it happen during 30 to 70 AD when the temple was destroyed? Did it happen right after that during the persecution of the Christians and the spreading of the church? There's some disagreement there. The Great Tribulation occurred either in the first century AD or it will be a brief time of persecution immediately preceding the millennium. All right? So basically they would say that, that you know, things are going to get great for a millennium and then things are going to get really bad briefly and then Jesus is going to come back. Uh, so we got the next one. Dispensational premillennialism. Okay. God will rapture Christians from the world before or possibly midway into the seven-year Great Tribulation. So they're pretty specific on the Tribulation. Jesus will return to earth after the Great Tribulation, but before the thousand-year millennium described in Revelation 20. So that's dispensational premillennialism, and that's a, that's a pretty popular one. That's one that's been around for quite a while, and, and if you grew up you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and, and you were talking about end times, there's a good chance that this is what was taught, okay? Next, here's a, this is an older one, but it's an older one that's gaining newer kind of a following and a newer understanding. Historical premillennialism, they call it historical because it's basically, as best as the scholars can tell, this is probably what the earliest Christians believed. Jesus will return to earth after a time of tribulation, but before the millennium, described in Revelation 20, Christians will remain on earth through the tribulation, okay, so instead of the rapture and dispensational premillennialism, 
Uh, <laughs> they're going to stay and, and, and deal with the tribulation with the rest of the people. This tribulation may be a short, intense time of persecution that will occur near the end of time or a long time period which has occurred throughout church history. Okay. Whew. This kept me up at night. Talking about these things, man. That's some heady stuff. I know people that, that love to talk about this and they love to, to discuss, you know, all the various ins and outs and the pros and the cons of each view and, and what they really believe. And that's great and that's important. But did you notice there were four? Did you notice that there were four views? Anybody? When you notice that there's four views about the same thing, what do you do with that? Because let's be honest, okay? We're going to take these four views. There are godly, amazing, brilliant people who have nothing in their heart other than to just glorify the Lord and to preach His, his, his second coming. They, they just, they're, everything about these views comes from a right place. It doesn't come from a wrong place. It comes from a God-honoring place. They truly and firmly believe that. And so you have just brilliant, amazing people who've been talking about this for years. And they haven't figured it out. Okay. So what am I supposed to know? Am I supposed to choose one? Should I join a camp? Should I wear a label? Should I fly a flag? Should I say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pre, post, mid with a slash of rapture and a little dash of, of awesomeness. <laughs> then there's the other ones. Then there's the ones who, you know, ashamedly, I used to be one of these. I used to be kind of, you know, just... I, if you hadn't guessed, I'm kind of a smart aleck, and I get to, I, sometimes I, I'm a little too sarcastic. I used to be what was called a pan-millennialist. I said, I'm a pan-millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> I learned of a new one. There's pro-millennialists. Whatever God does it, it's good with me. <laughs> and, you know, it's, that's, uh, there's a certain measure of, of truth in that in a, in a certain way, but you know what? That's kind of a cop-out. You should study. You should know these things. You should have a belief. You should have a conviction. And the, the heart behind that is there's a place in Scripture that says, you know, we should always be ready and prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. You know, there are going to be people that are going to come up to and say, what do you think about the end times? You should be ready to at least be able to explain what you believe and not just say, eh, I don't know, it'll happen. The end will come, I think. You should know something. Even if you say, hey, I think this, I, I, I can't say 100% it is this way, but I really do believe this. That's great, and you should. But for all of us, since we all might come from different, different walks and different backgrounds, and all of us might have been reading one of these and saying, yeah, I'm that one, looking around, are you, what are you? you know, and, and no one wants to talk about it. What are we going to look at that's important? What are we going to look at that, that are the cores? And the amazing thing is, you know, I, I saw, I was watching a, a show where there was Piper and Storms and Wilson and a bunch of, you know, brilliant preachers and they were all, they all had different views and they were talking about it and they came together and they said, yeah, but you know what, we all, we all love the Lord and there's some things that we all agree on even though we have varying differences. So we're going to focus on those things. We're going to focus on what do these all have in agreement? What's important for us to really know about the end times? Why is that important right now? It's Christmas time. All right, so what do I really need to know? First and foremost, Jesus is coming back. Amen? That's the best thing. I don't know about you, but I've always feel, felt kind of cheated as a Christian because I didn't get to live in the time where Jesus was around. I have to live in the time where I have to take everything on faith. I didn't get to see him physically, and I didn't get to, didn't get to experience his teaching firsthand. Jesus coming back is going to be awesome because he's amazing. He loves us. Now, I mean, there's going to be some serious stuff that goes on when Jesus comes back, but I'm excited about it. I'm pumped up for it. I want Jesus to come back. Don't you? I want Jesus to come back. And they all agree on this, that, that absolutely 100% Jesus is coming back 
You know, it's interesting. When we first opened up this passage, I'll, I'll read it really quick again. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Okay, so they're walking by the temple, and it was said of Herod's temple that if you hadn't seen Herod's temple, you'd never seen a beautiful building. It was just amazing. It was awe-inspiring. It was gorgeous. It was ornate. And they, the disciples, they run up to Jesus, and they say, look at this. Isn't this great? Look at what we've created. And he turns to him and he says this, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every single one will be thrown down. That's just a bummer for the disciples. Because the temple was the cornerstone of their faith, the cornerstone of their upbringing. I mean, it was everything to them. And sometimes we have our views of the end times, our amillennialism, our premillennialism, our postmillennialism, our panmillennialism, whatever. And we say, look at what we've created. We spent all this time and effort, and we think we've got it figured out. And I wonder if we brought that all to Jesus, what would he say? I think, and you know, Lord, forgive me if this is wrong, but I really just, you know, in, in seeing the character of Jesus whenever people think they've got it all figured out and they bring that to Jesus. It just seems like he might say, are you still so dull that you're not getting it? You're missing the point. You spent how many hours sitting around and trying to figure this all out and and have the right answer? You missed the boat. You missed the point. You might just tear that down a little bit. Why? Why would he do that? Here's something that Jesus says. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ. Okay, so he starts, instead of telling them right off, because they ask, you know, okay, so, okay, everything's going to get torn down, Jesus. That's great. That's awesome. Thanks for just destroying our, our conception of reality. Fine. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And he says, he doesn't say 2060 A.D., He doesn't say this specific thing will happen and then a specific thing will happen and this specific thing will happen and then this specific thing will happen and then you will know because everyone will know. It'll just be clear and plain and obvious and everyone will understand that I'm going to come back right then. He doesn't say that at all. Instead, he goes into a, a, a heartfelt talk about, hey, we're going to talk about this, but here's the thing. You need to know about some stuff. You need to know that it's going to be hard for you. You need to know that, yeah, I'm going to come back, and don't worry, but there's going to be wars, and there's going to be famines, and there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be many that come claiming to be me, and they're not going to be me. You need to be ready. You need to be on guard. It's going to be hard for you in these days to come. Jesus is coming back. And he says that over and over again throughout this, 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 this passage that he tells them. In, in verse 27, he says, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In verse 30, At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Verse 37, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Did you catch that? He keeps bringing that into their attention. I'm coming back. I'm going to return. That's important for you to know. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how much you suffer, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you believe about when the end times are are happening and how they happen and what happens first, trib, millennial stuff, doesn't matter. I'm coming back. That's the point. The beginning and the end has always been me. The whole Bible, the whole point of the Bible is Jesus. Don't ever miss that. Don't get so caught up in talking about Jesus that you miss Jesus himself. That's what the Pharisees did. Got so caught up in predictions and thoughts and, and rules and, 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 and what, they, what they understood to be right and true that they missed Jesus in the flesh. 
The whole point is Jesus. Alpha and omega, beginning and end. Jesus starts in human history creating humanity, that all things were created through him. And then Jesus re-enters human history in the first coming in Christmas, and he restores humanity. He makes it possible for us to re-enter relationship with God. And then he's going to come again, and it's going to be the end of, of, of what we know as time and, and, and humanity and reality. And he's going to bring it into a new thing, an eternal kingdom that he's prepared for us. And it's wonderful and it's amazing. That's the point. That's what we need to look forward to. Okay, when? How do we know? Okay, here's what Jesus says. 45 through 47. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Let's, as far as just knowing when, no one knows about that day or hour in verse 36. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay, that's crazy. Not even the Son knows. Did you catch that? He's the Son. Now, there's a crazy fancy term called kenosis. And it has to do with the limiting of, of divinity, that, that Jesus emptied himself as divinity. We're not going to talk about that. So if you were like just waiting, oh, I hope he talks about kenosis. It's not going to happen. All right. If you want to talk about that, we'll talk about that after the sermon. But I think it's added there. I think Jesus has it in there for a good reason. He's saying, hey, I don't even know. You're definitely not going to know. You're not going to be able to predict when this is going to happen. It's going to happen. You need to know that. I'm coming back. The world's going to end. There's going to be an end. But you do not know the time. And, they, and people will say, okay, wait a second. But he says the day and the hour unknown. So we could know the month. And if you're a millennial or a premillennial or a postmillennial, I think we got it down to like a season at least. No, day and hour, the way Jesus used it, is a, a cultural idiom at the time. And basically it just means the time. It means a time, not just the time, but the specific time. So he's basically saying, you're not going to know. Give it up. But why? Why would he say that? Why would he frustrate his disciples like that? They asked him an honest question. They said, Lord, we just need to know when you're coming back. It's going to be hard without you. Give us some hope. And here's what he says. He says we're to be ready at all times. We are commanded to be ready because no one knows when he's coming back, but he is coming back. So every day, every moment of every day, every week, every month, every season, every year, when you start thinking about your five-year plan and your 10-year plan and start planning your retirement, nobody's retiring? Anybody retiring? Good, that's right. Die preaching the gospel. That's my plan. Be ready at all times. We are commanded. It's not a a subtle hint. Jesus says this again and again. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect Him. I, I can't get more clear than that. Be ready at all times for the coming of Christ. Okay. Well, what else does he say? He says this, and I love this part of this. I really do. And I think we miss this sometimes whenever we talk about the end times. We talk about millennialism and tribulation. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? This servant has tasks, stuff to do. There's things he's supposed to be doing. I tell you the truth, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. People, when Jesus returns, I hope that I'm about his business and not about mine. I hope that I am fully engaged in the task that he laid before me. I hope that you are fully engaged in the task that he has for you. And he has a task for you. He has a task for all of us. Amen? He has a plan for all of our lives. He has a purpose for all of us. All of us are created uniquely and amazingly to fulfill some aspect of his kingdom. And you have everything you could possibly need. If you are a believer, if you are a child of God, you have been given everything you need to accomplish the things that God is is setting before you. There's no excuses. It's time to get up off the couch and do it. Because Jesus could come back at any moment. He could return at any time. 
and our master is coming, and I hope he finds you busy about this business. So we are called to, we are commanded to be, to be ready, and we are called to be active, actively participating, actively doing what he calls us to do. Okay. What else do we need to know? Okay, so all of all all the, the four views and the proponents of the four views and the people that all believe it and the people that all talk about it, they all believe this. They believe that Jesus is coming back and they believe that we are called to be ready, that he will come back at a time when, when no one really knows exactly when it's going to happen and, and that the way that's going to happen is just amazing. And we are called to be active. We are called to be about his business. So what's the other thing? What else should we take away from this? What else should we know? And here it is, and this is kind of a, a duh statement, but we should meditate on this. We should, we should chew this around. We should, we should keep this in our, our focus. The thing that Jesus keeps talking about and he doesn't mince words about is there will be an end. There is there's an end to this. Why is that important? It scares me. But it doesn't scare me in the way that a lot of times, you know, in things, they scare us sometimes. If we're honest, we talk about end times and we get a little nervous and we get a little worried. Am I going to be raptured? Am I going to be stuck? I don't want to be left behind. Those things that happen in those movies were freaky. I don't, I don't want to be stuck in that. I, don't, I, want to be, I want to be taken up into heaven right away and just skip it all. You know, or maybe we just believe that no matter what happens, you know, I, I need to know so that I'm ready for the Antichrist and the False Christ because they're scary and I don't want to take the mark of the beast. And I, okay, that's, I know, but you know what? Fear doesn't come from the Lord. Fear comes from you. And if you're letting fear dictate your understanding of Scripture, there's a problem there. And if you're propelled by fear, there's something that, that needs to not be there. You know, one, all, all of... All of uh, all of these, these points, they all point to the fact that being a child of God is a good thing. Being His is a good thing. And no matter how this happens, belonging to Him is where you need to be. That's, that's huge. Because there will be an end. And if I, if I try to, you know, let's, let's flush that out. Let's flush the end out. Why is that important? Because there will be an end to opportunity. There's going to be an end to your opportunity to accept Him and to become His child. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, there will be an end and you will no longer have time to accept. You will no longer have the opportunity. Maybe you're a Christian and you're, just, you're doubting and you're not sure how to live. There's going to be an end of opportunity for you to get right with Him and really live in relationship with Him. And then there's more than that. There's, there's going to be an end to opportunity for you to start being the person you're called to be. Sir, there's, there's an end to the opportunity for you to start being the husband that you were called to be, that, that Christ crafted you and is building in you to be. Ma'am, there's, there's, an, there's an end to the opportunity for you to be the wife that you're called to be, that Christ is, is creating you. People, there's an end to an opportunity for you to start being the mothers and the fathers that your children need. There's an end to that opportunity. For those of you with family members who may not know the Lord and you put off and you keep putting off talking to them because it's just scary and it's just hard, there's going to be an end to that opportunity. There's going to be a time when you will not have a chance anymore. Or what about your coworkers and what about your, your, your colleagues? What about your schoolmates? There's going to be an end to opportunity for you to share your faith with them. To see them have the same hope and the same, the same faith and the same peace that comes from knowing that they're a child of God and that, that no matter if you're amillennial or premillennial or postmillennial, that at the end, the second coming of Christ is going to be amazing and that you want to be on His team. There's going to be an end of opportunity for you to share that. Or maybe God's calling you to do something. You know, Joel and Janice, get this! The Cambodia team, they get this. There's an opportunity and they're taking it. 
Because there's going to be a time when there's no more moments for you to really live for the Lord. And you need to start doing it. There will be an end. It's time to start living like each day could be your last. Because even not talking about the last things, people, we don't know how much time we've got. Any one of us. There are, there are, you know, there are a million ways to die. There are a million ways for those we love and care about to pass, sadly, or to just be taken from us suddenly. You may think you have opportunity and you may be putting it off for the right time. The right time is now. Because we're all living in a time where there is an end point and we're getting closer to it every single day. There will be an end opportunity for you to live for the Lord. We need to live for the Lord. We need to be ready. We need to be eagerly waiting for His coming. And we need to be about His business. We need to be preaching the Gospel and preaching the Word because there's power and it is the only thing that gets you through all this. All the trib, all the mill, all the rapture, whatever it is. The only thing that gets you through that is Christ. And if you don't have Christ, there's no hope. There's no peace. So have Christ, know Christ, and preach Christ while you have opportunity. Every day. I'm going to invite the intercessors to come up, the worship team, and we're going to pray. There's going to be a time of prayer and a time of response. And right now, I would just encourage you to think about the opportunity that you have right now today. What do you have the opportunity to do? What have you been putting off for far too long? What is it that you're delaying? It's Stop. We need to be that servant whose master comes home and he sees us about his business and he has business for all of us. It's time to So right now, we're going to bow our heads. So please stand. We're going we're gonna to try that for a little bit. We're going to stand and the worship team's going to play and I'm going to pray and then if you're here and, and you just feel a heaviness, a burden, and you're just ready to do something for the Lord, I would encourage you to tell someone about it. Come over to the side and have someone pray with you. If there's a, a moment that you sense the Lord just giving you a heaviness, saying, you know what, I need, to, I need to get real. I need to really start living for Him. I need to start being the husband and the father and the mother or the daughter or the friend or the co-worker that I'm called to be, that He's created me to be. Because now is that time. Lord God, help us to know. Lord God, help us to be ready for You. Lord, may we be about Your business and not about our own. Lord, may we seize opportunities while we have the opportunity. Lord, we're, we're living on borrowed time. There's an end coming, and it's coming soon. Lord, we're excited about You. We're overjoyed, Lord, that You are our God. Lord, I wouldn't have it any other way. Lord, we thank you that you are good. You are perfect. Lord, the business that you have for us, it is a joy. It's not a burden. It's a blessing. It's not a curse, Lord. Lord, may we be about your business. May we be always ready. May we be eagerly waiting for you to return. May we be preaching that and teaching that every day of our lives, not just with our words, but with our lives, Lord, with every beat of us. May we be making the most of the opportunities that you have given us. Lord, I pray that all of us would know what it is that you're calling us to do and that we would do it, Lord, that we would be faithful, that we would, the cornerstone would be a faithful church that we would be a faithful body. Lord, that we would be continually made into your bride, that we would be prepared 
for you. We thank you and praise you. In your name. Amen.